Chair for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be joined by special guest Nigel Turner to talk about data quality best practices. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. We very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. And if you'd like to continue the networking and conversation after the webinar and to learn more about Donna, just go to community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Donna Burbank and Nigel Turner. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Strategies Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And joining Donna today is Nigel, who has worked in information management related and related areas for over 20 years. This experience has embraced has embraced data governance, information strategy, data quality, data governance, master data management, and business intelligence. He is a great advocate for keeping information management as simple and business focused as possible and feels that a key role of information management professionals is to help business people relate to information management to real business benefits. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these. Um, and thank you to all of the familiar names and some faces <laughs> on the call. Um, always nice. We get a lot of repeat folks, and I know you guys are always very popular in, in, in the chat, which is always nice to kind of see. I don't always answer because I'm a terrible multitasker, but I always appreciate seeing it after. Um, and for those of you who have been on previous webinars, you realize that they are all on demand. So if this is the first time joining us, thank you very much. Um, and any, any of these other topics are of interest to you, Data Diversity is very good about keeping things, I think, indefinitely, so both the slides and the recording. Or if you know that you were just so excited by this, you want to catch it again, you, you will have an opportunity. Um, um, so this month, as Shannon mentioned, we have my colleague Nigel Turner, so it's always a pleasure to have him over from Wales virtually. Um, and the next month we'll be talking about self-service BI and analytics. So we hope you can join us for the few remaining this year, and then we already have an exciting plan uh, lineup next year as well. So uh, without further ado, today we're talking about data quality. And data quality, for those of you who are data quality experts or are trying to embark on a data quality program, realize that it, it's more complicated than it seems. A lot of these issues, and we'll talk a lot about that, seem very simple on the surface. You know, how hard is it the uh, zip code is wrong or, or, you know, the gender code is wrong and the medical record, how, can't we just fix it? Well, you know, as we get into root cause, really to get these right or to get them right long term and not just a quick fix, it really is a holistic architectural approach uh, that's people, process, and tech. And we'll talk about all of those. And as the theme of this is data architecture, we always like to take and just sort of our, our, our way of working in general is to kind of look broadly. Um, so many of you who have joined the presentations before know have seen this, this architecture slide. We sort of always go back to this framework because, well, because you kind of can't not do it, right? Because as Nigel and I were, as we were preparing this, we kept going back and forth of, you know, what it gets a bit of a, a meta conversation. And, and we, you know, we're big fans of looking holistically. To understand data quality, you need to look at business strategy. Um, which drives everything. Why is this important? What is the business meaning of a, a rule? What's the business you know, value of, of fixing some of these things? Who are the people governing it? You know, do we have the right architecture to design the data quality and keep it relevant? Do we have metadata management to know what those rules are? And we sort of kept checking ourselves of saying, um, is that data quality or is that governance? Are they the same thing? Because they are, are so intertwined, right? Uh, but a lot of these topics we have done a deep down, deep dive in in previous or future webinars. So we can't obviously cover everything in an hour. So what we're going to do in this particular presentation, and we haven't done this one in a while, um, is just talk about data quality. And of course, there'll be touch points with everything. So as I mentioned, you can't think of data quality without governance. They, they go hand in hand. You shouldn't think of data quality without understanding the business context 
I would argue you can't do Medidacol without understanding the metadata, the technical and business lineage and, and understanding of it. So we'll touch on this. Um, you know it's a favorite slide of mine because it just, it, to me it sums up a lot of the interconnectedness of all of these disciplines, um, which is nice. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it and we'll kind of switch back and forth as we do uh, to my colleague Nigel who will sort of kick us off and he's been working many years in data quality so we're interested in what he has to say. So Nigel, welcome. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Donna, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening to this webinar. Um, I was enjoying the warm-up music at the beginning, and I had absolutely no idea that Donna and Shannon were such good singers. But um, anyway, you learn something new from these things uh, every time. So basically, in the agenda today, what, what I'm going to cover is with Donna is basically start by some basic definitions. Uh, as Shannon said earlier, I like to keep things simple. And that's certainly true with data quality. And then obviously to cover, well, why does it matter for many organizations? I'll try and prove why it matters by giving you a couple of pretty recent examples of what happens when data quality goes wrong. Talk in more general terms about how poor data quality can really hurt an organization and stop it doing the things it wants to do. And then look at, but I really finish off then by talking about how data quality has been traditionally approached and addressed in many organizations and why that approach still has value, but it's no longer the only way to tackle things. And that now, more, much more, as Donna said earlier, holistic approaches are needed. When I started in data quality, data quality was seen almost as a, as a discipline in itself, almost devoid and, and, and outside all other data disciplines. Today, as Donna said, you know, what we're finding is that data quality now has to be done as an integral and inherent part of any data management initiative within an organization for it to really succeed and to reap the benefits. And hopefully, if we finish on time, we'll also have time for some Q&A at the end. So start with some, oh, I don't know where that one's gone, Donna, but we're on slide 16, um, according to me. Thank you. Uh, data quality, a simple definition, um, and this is my definition of data quality. There are many definitions out there. And of course, as always, some of them are very complicated. I, I think this one is, is, is my favorite simply because it's simple. And what does that mean, demonstrably fit for purpose? I think demonstrably means that it's all very well saying, well, I think our data quality is OK, or I got a feeling that we could improve it a bit. It's all about quantifying and proving um, how good your data actually is. So that implies that really data quality, an essential component of any sort of data quality management or improvement is that you can measure the baseline, i.e. how good is your data quality now? I'll put some numbers around that. Look at what sort of numbers you need to achieve to get the data quality fit for purpose, and then come up with plans for how you get from where you are to where you want to go. And the second bit of that, fit for purpose, what does that mean? I think the other key message in that is that data quality isn't an absolute. And I worked, and Donna has, in, in, in many organizations uh, in the last um, few years. And there isn't a single organization out there that can put their hand in the air and say, we've solved, we've got our data quality totally under control, where all our data is 100% accurate, 100% uh, complete and reliable, wherever it stands. That isn't true. So what is fit for purpose basically means is that depending on its uses, um, then that data is good enough for the use it's put to. So if you're doing a monthly finance report and the data that goes into that report is two weeks out of date before it's published, that doesn't really matter um, because that window is fine. But if you're working in a transactional system or an online uh, purchasing system where you need the data to be right and uh, right up to date for it to work within the context of the business process, then the quality of data needs to be well, pretty much 100% right away, straight at the beginning. So that these sorts of things have to be put in that business context, as Donna said. And you know, what does having data that is demonstrably fit for purpose means? Well, it means those things there. I think, first of all, that it needs to be accurate enough. And what accuracy means, I think, is does it model uh, the real world? So, you know, uh, if, if a company out there has my national insurance number, is that my correct NI number? If it isn't, then it's inaccurate, doesn't model the real world. Simple as that. Completeness simply means do you have all the data that you need? So if, for example, you're uh, doing online marketing and you've got a, a load of customers in your CRM system with no valid email address, then clearly your data isn't complete and fit for purpose. Reliability simply means is the data consistent in different sources? So disregarding the timescale thing I mentioned earlier, generally speaking, 
you know, if you have details on me as a customer in your in your CRM system, it should roughly be the same in your marketing system and maybe as well in your sales system. So basically, you need to be sure that, that the data is reliable. And then those are what I call the content criteria of data quality. In other words, the data itself. The other two are about the context. So obviously, date, having high data quality isn't any good if the people who need access to it can't get access to it when they need it. And the second thing I mentioned is timeliness. So if you're working as part of a process, you need data that was accurate as of yesterday, then it's pointless having that data a week too late because it simply won't work. So basically, um, that, that's a fairly simple definition, I think. And, and why does that matter? Well, I'm sure this is a slide that many of you will be very familiar with. Not, maybe not exactly this slide, but certainly some of the, um, the key messages in the slide which is that if data quality isn't fit for purpose and demonstrably fit, it has a very negative impact on companies and organizations. Um, it has an impact which is e economic uh, on a company. It hits the bottom line of any organization, whether they're a private company or even a government department, because you know government departments have, have incomes and they have costs to me. And revenue is a good example. I mean, you can lose a lot of revenue if your data isn't fit for purpose. Two examples, if you've got poor marketing data, for example, and you rely very heavily on marketing mail shots to your clients, then the chances are that the response rate of that will be lower than you expect, and therefore the revenues you would hope to achieve from that are going to be lower than you would want. Similarly, um, in terms of costs, I mean, this is the famous phrase that, that one of the gurus of data quality came up with, Larry English, when he talked about the cost of failure. So every time data is wrong and not fit for purpose within a business process, somebody somewhere usually has to do something to put it right. And not getting it right first time incurs the costs. And those costs, as you'll see later, can really add up. And of course, if your costs are higher than they need to be because of poor data, your revenues are lower than they should be, then that impacts profits and the bottom line in a commercial organization. But it isn't just about economic costs because poor data quality also impacts other things. So, you know, I'm sure we've all seen, and I'll come to a couple in a minute, horror stories from organizations who got data wrong. It impacts their brand, damages their reputation, and also damages their customer loyalty. Um, I, 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 because I'm, I'm a bit of a geek about these things, I have a policy that if any organization sends me a communication, whether it's through the post or through email or any other way, and they cannot get my basic details right, like how to spell my name, for example, I think, well, they obviously don't manage data very well. I suspect they wouldn't manage my insurance very well or sell very good car parts. If they can't get that right, then it does give an indication, I think, that the company is not trustworthy in some way. And of course, a big driver of recent years, particularly in some parts of the world, has been the importance of data quality in terms of law and regulation. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the general data protection regulation that came into force across the European Union in May 2018. Uh, and Article 4 of that states very simply, data should be accurate and where necessary, kept up to date. And they put that phrase in where necessary, meaning it must be fit for business purpose and in comply with personal data laws within the European Union. So all those things are very good reasons why you need to get it right. But despite those reasons, companies still get it wrong. And here's a couple of very recent examples. Um, the first one might surprise you because Amazon is often held up quite rightly, I think, as a paragon of good data management. Uh, you know, they are a data management company, first and foremost, that happens to sell things. So it goes to prove that these errors can happen to the best uh, companies in the world. But basically, this happened in their, um, in their Amazon Prime Day, uh, which weirdly extends over two days, the 15th and 16th of July 2019. And I think there the bullet points basically tell the story. That lens normally, if you want to buy it, is about £10,000, $13,000. But at the start of Prime Day, they quoted a price for that of £78. <clears throat> Eventually, that, that, that error was spotted, and they adjusted the price to the correct price, which was about $9,500. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, and such is the power of social media, as soon as a few keen souls got on the site and noticed that, they told all their friends and they told lots of other people as well. And hundreds at least, they, Amazon won't say how many of those lenses were purchased at that incredible price of $94. And Amazon decided, rather than, rather than get into any legal complications, honored the deal. 
But in effect, they lost £6,000, about $7,500 for every lens they sold. Now, Amazon, you say, can afford that, and good luck to the consumers. But that's a great example, I think, of where hundreds of thousands of pounds can be lost by an organization because of one fairly simple error. And, of course, it's an error that you think would be quite easily spotted because the average uh, re reduction, apparently, in Prime Day was about 25 to 30%. So a simple business rule that says, is this sale price 25 or 30 percent lower than the full price, then Amazon would never have published that price in the first place. So even the best of us can make mistakes. So that's a, an example, I think, very recent example of an economic consequence of bad data. But I've got a more personal one as well. Not personal to me, thank goodness. Uh, but this was one very recently that I came across in the UK in, that, uh, in our much beloved National Health Service. And there was a man who entered hospital for a cystop I can't even say it, cystoscopy operation. Uh, if you don't know what that is, because I had to look it up, it's where a camera is inserted into someone's bladder uh, to actually do some uh, examining the, the state of the inside of the bladder. But unfortunately, at the same time in the hospital was another patient who had a very similar name. And I've avoided uh, saying what that name is. But I think golden rule is if you go into hospital, make sure you've got an unusual name. This is far less likely to happen to you. And then when this guy came around from his operation, he'd been confused with the other patient and he was given a circumcision instead of a cystoscopy. And now, um, I mentioned earlier about uh, poor data quality being a cost of failure. I think you'd call that one probably a cut of failure. But uh, it was one of a string of errors at the hospital around bad management of data and bad implementation of, of, of data. And so a major investigation is now underway into the workings of that hospital. So the brand, the reputation of that hospital, apart from the injuries to the poor man, um, are things that don't go away very easily once you get these things wrong. And Donna and I have worked in lots of different companies in the last couple of years. Uh, one of the things we like to do when we interview stakeholders, when we do uh, data assessments and data maturity assessments, is to take some quotes down from some of the things that some of these people say. And these are from a number of different companies, from different industries, different sectors, different roles, different parts of the world. And yet some of these issues seem to come up time and time again. And I certainly won't go through them all. But you can see such things like um, the bottom right, I think, is probably my favorite, which was a conversation with a marketing manager in one of our client companies. Well, we don't really know how good our data is. And the only way we find out if it's wrong is if a customer contacts us. Um, and tells us. And basically what they do is when they do a marketing uh, exercise, they basically assemble the data, they wish for the best, and they press a button and send it. And that's not really a very good feedback loop, I think, for data management and data improvement. Lots of companies tell us as well that there's no accountability for bad quality data. And come back to that later. Basically, no one is responsible. Um, and I think the top right is also significant, that so there's a lack of appreciation of what happens to data from the front end to the back end. I always like data quality problems, too. I don't know if you remember Newton's Cradle, which was an old executive toy that was very popular back in the 1990s, for those of you old enough to remember. And there are a series of balls hang on strings. You hit the ball at one end, and because of Newton's laws, the ball at the other end springs out. That's what often happens with data, that where the problems are caused is often not where the problems have an impact and cause pain. So that's one of the th reasons why you need a holistic cross-company approach to data quality rather than a project basis to data quality. But you can see there are lots and lots of negative impacts of poor data. And if you add all those negative impacts up, then here's some fairly recent evidence, some of it's a little older than others, of many studies that have been done to show how damaging bad data quality actually is. The top two really are about the, the company level uh, the most recent data that we got there is from BARC, B-A-R-C, which was done earlier this year. Uh, they, they interviewed, an, uh, they surveyed a lot of organizations who said that half of them said that a quarter of all the data they hold, they believe to be inaccurate. And in our experience, if they think a quarter of their data is inaccurate, in reality, it's probably more like a half. So that's probably an underestimate. On top right, this is, a, this is a figure that's been validated time and time again. But if you have an organization where data quality problems are endemic, that can cost you up to a quarter of your revenue in things like failure costs and loss of revenue. It's really quite staggering. And top bottom left is really an economy-wide impact where that was done by IBM a few couple of years ago, where they basically calculated that you know, over $3 trillion a year in the US are lost to the economy 
because of data quality issues. And uh, the bottom right one from the UK, um, you know, just customer data alone and the problems with that costing um, a company an average of 6% of their annual revenues. So it seems a bit weird, doesn't it? We all sort of recognize how important good data quality is, and yet these problems persist. What's more scary was some of these numbers simply reflect what I remember when I first started in this, something like 15, 20 years ago. So why has the situation not improved? So I suppose the next the question is, why do these things continue to persist? Well, the first thing to say is, of course, that the, the data world has changed an awful lot in the last 20 years. Um, and therefore, the problems that organizations are dealing with today are not the same problems that organizations were dealing with when I started in this back in the late 1990s. The data world has simply become more complex and diffuse. So apart from we all know about the increasing volumes of data that every company is now experiencing, in many companies it's doubling every 15 months. It's also the speed by which that data is processed has increased as things like uh, Internet of Things technologies come in. And also, of course, the variety of data is so much broader than it used to be, where you've now got structured, semi-structured, stream data, unstructured data, et cetera, all hitting a company much more hard. So getting a handle on that is obviously more difficult than it used to be. Second reason is the age-old one that I've said earlier, that accurate data models the world. And unfortunately, the world changes. So if you don't take proactive steps in your organization to capture those changes, and model them in your data, your data in, inevitably, inherently gets out of date the day after you first collect it, in many cases. The third thing is that I've been in many, many organizations where the predominant paradigm is unfortunately still this, oh, data's not, data quality's poor, yeah, it's all IT's fault. It's not IT's fault, data is a business asset and it's a business problem, and many of the data quality problems in a business are caused by the business. And therefore, to sort it out, the business has to take prime responsibility for that. And um, people will make mistakes with data, as they did in that hospital in the NHS. And that inevitably is going to happen. So you need to have to cater for that. Um, we talked in other webinars, I know Donna has, about the lack of common data definitions and metadata around data, which can cause people to misinterpret it and misuse it. I've mentioned the data Newton's cradle. It's harder to solve the problem where the people creating the problem don't feel the pain because you've got to get the people who do feel the pain to talk to the people that create the problem. And very often in some organizations where they're siloed, that's quite a hard thing to do. And then finally, as Donna said earlier, it's all about governance. If nobody is responsible for improving data, well, guess what happens? No data is improved. And we see that time and time again. So take each of some of these in turn. This is a little diagram I came across recently about the data world becoming more complex. And I admire uh, the people that created this from FirstMark. Um, this must have taken them a very long time. Um, and it looks very pretty, but I think it's an indication of how much more complex the data landscape is today uh, than it has been in the past. And I think that reflects the, the, the increasing variety, velocity, and variability of data. And I think it also reflects the fact that the data management industry with things like big data, et cetera, is getting much, much more popular. So there's a lot more vendors out there than there used to be. When I started in data management many years ago, we had mainframe computers and dumb terminals. It was a lot easier to manage data in that environment. In this environment, all those tools there all hold, process, and manage data. So how do you start to address a problem where varieties in that data across those platforms and systems are inevitable? You simply cannot get all those or keep all those completely up to date. And I mentioned also earlier the world changes. Here's a little bit of research on the next slide that I did earlier. Not earlier today, I mean earlier this year. And, um, you know, the world does change, and it changes in surprisingly quickly. And in the UK, just to put all this in context, um, there are about 60 million people who live here at the moment. And so you can put those, those into some sort of context, that 3 million of those 60 million, 5% roughly, they move house every year. So if you've got a marketing database with customers on it, if you don't actively seek to keep that, to keep on top of that, then every year you lose 3 million people basically off your marketing list if you've got their address wrong. Lots of babies are born every year, lots of people die every year, of course, unfortunately. Lots of people get divorced. Um, that causes all sorts of splits. Um, and of course, people come into countries and leave countries as well. Although in the current Brexit mess we're in, goodness knows what those figures will look like in one or two years time. Your guess is as good as mine. 
And it's not just on the consumer side that data changes all the time. These are some facts from business to business, B2B as well. And there are about 5 million businesses at the moment in the UK. And, um, they, and half a million roughly new businesses start up every year. And of course, a lot of companies also disappear every year. So if you're doing B2B, then keeping track of that is quite a challenge. And surprising figure on the bottom left, but I've seen this validated in several places, that 30%, roughly a third of business people, actually change their email address every year. So if you're trying to keep a contact database for your B2B contacts, if you don't actively manage that in some way, then that's going to be out of date in three years, basically completely useless in four. And their average decay is about 2% a month. So, you know, again, if you don't actively manage these things, things tend to go wrong. So those are a couple of reasons why data quality problems persist. And I'll hand over the back to Donna now, who's going to talk about some other reasons why these problems continue. Yep, and and I think a lot of you can probably uh, relate to some of those. And I think, you know, more importantly, of I think we can all sort of understand them, but how do we fix it, right? Because so hopefully that's why you joined this call. So as, as Nigel mentioned, it's not an IT problem. It's, it's not only an IT problem. It, it's also a business problem. So I think the key is getting both IT and business working together, because generally it's a piece of everything. It's not that IT is innocent either, right? So... Um, so if you kind of look at the triangle of people, process, and technology, sometimes it's just human error. It's such when, you know, there's manual data entry, which even with automation can't always be avoided. Often that's how you get the data in. Um, but then that's, you know, for example, where pairings with technology can help. Can we make, yes, maybe the, the person put the wrong gender code into the hospital and they put, you know, male instead of the word the letter M, um, but could we have the system just with the drop down? You know, if there's only two values or there's four values or whatever in the gender code, then make sure those are the right ones. So, or if you know you're doing 90% of your business in a certain region or state, can we auto default that? To, you know, just minimize human error. So I think that you know, understanding how the data is used, which we've talked about, how technology can help with that, um, can be a big idea, a, a big benefit. Um, and so sometimes it's the, the human interface with technology that has the poor design, and sometimes it's the business process itself. So when we look at sort of the idea of these data silos, so much of that, and I, I've kind of been looking a bit at some of the comments, you know, when we say things like fit for purpose, whose purpose, right? I mean, that's exactly the issue, and that's where things like governance come into play. So certain things have enterprise-wide standards. Can we all agree if gender code is M and F or, you know, T for transgender, or do we use the word male or do we use the word female? Let's just agree on some of the basics and make sure that's done consistently. Um, but also understand what usage, because sometimes that's where the data problems come up. Um, so kind of getting those agreed standards, making sure they're part of the business process, that people are following those rules, making sure everyone's trained. Really, that's kind of the, the crux of, of getting everything right. Um, and that really ties into the accountability. As Nigel mentioned, we do a lot of these uh, projects, and often we kind of start out with interviews, and you probably do similar things, whether you're a consultant or whether you're just you know, working with your team, and you might sort of ask, you know, introduce yourself as being part of the data governance team or the data quality team. And often people, you know, everyone loves to vent about the problems, and they say, great, so you're going to fix that, right? No, we're going to fix that, right? So, yes, it's partly things the systems can do. We can help with metadata, but either the data is entered by, you know, often business people or the data, should, those rules should come from business people. What you don't want, and I, I think IT can be just as frustrated. I don't want to have to come up with a business rule for how total sales is calculated. <laughs> that should be sales or accounting, right? not, not me. No, but sometimes just because things need to get out the door, that happens. So one of the quotes that came from one of our customers that we liked, because um, it just sums it up, if, if we're all, you know, we often start with kind of best principles. Data is everybody's responsibility if, if you start with kind of core principles with your data governance. And they kind of say, yeah, but if we're all responsible, no one's responsible, right? <laughs> and nothing changes. So, yes, we all should take care of data quality, but I am responsible for the sales data that I type into my CRM system, right? So... I think defining that, you know, we can talk about the general issues. Amazon had some problems with sales, but who who could have uh, affected that? Was it an IT issue? Is it a, a business issue? And not, you know, not to punish people, but to really understand root cause and give people stewardship and accountability over these. And that really helps with kind of turning this big ship around, right? So it's, it's not something that can happen overnight. It happens over time. Um, but some of the things you can help to make that ship turn around um, – is that business-led data governance framework. And both Nigel and I could wax poetic for hours about data governance. It's near and dear to our heart in different ways. Um, but really getting that framework and the organization in place to understand what, what data you're prioritizing, 
who does what, what organization, how do we escalate these issues. Data quality is as much a process and a people and a policy issue as, as much as it is a technology issue. And now once you have that framework in place, you have the right people at the table. And IT is right when they say, I shouldn't be the one coming up with your, I, I don't know, is it M or is it mail? Is it, you know, or does that mean something else altogether? Um, so that should be the business or your steering committee or your stewards, your owners really coming up with that. And then when you have that, reuse it. Um, and so when we have these data silos, often the problem is, you know, maybe one part of the organization solves it and we want to make sure, you know, we're, if you have something like a data quality tool or, or you, you have a holistic master data system, that these same rule, rules are used across the organization so that you don't fix something in one place and it just gets spoiled down the road. Where you can automate, all the better. And we want to be careful what we mean by this because I think, um, I think Nigel and I can still remember a very painful call in the beginning when we were trying to explain to one particular, generally 99.9% .9 percent of the people we work with are very understanding of this. But there was one in particular, he's, we were trying to explain the data quality issue, and he said, gosh, can't you just come in and like zap the, the address data and be done with it? You know, how complicated could this be? It's address data. And uh, needless to say, that was a challenging project, because it might seem like that is just so easy, and you can just automate it. But yes, you can automate it. And the analogy we often use is you can clean up the, the, the pond in your backyard. There's some pollution in the pond. But if, you, if the pollution is coming in from the streams feeding that pond, your pond is going to still get dirty, right? So I think a lot of people reasonably, I guess, in the beginning, think, well, just, just run that, the profiling script again. And do we not there's automated tools that can do this? Yes, there are. But you need to make sure those automated tools are using the right rules. And those automated tools are aligned with your business process. And they're being done at the source system, not the way at a warehouse. Too often you know, people sort of catch it after the fact and think they're done. Well, yes, we caught that these... These codes are wrong. How do we how do we fix that? Is it master data that we need to publish? Is it reference data? Is it metadata about how to use it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that really ties into the next one, which is obviously near and dear to my heart, is really linking to that data architecture. And data architecture I'm using very broadly. It is it do we have a data model to understand what we mean by customer and how that links with a contact, et cetera? Um, what the fields are, what the valid value I mean so many of the I, I I might even be slightly worse than Nigel on these rants about uh, when I get the, uh, something wrong in the mail with my name wrong, or they my bank sends me an ad for a credit card that I already own and things like that because I know how that can be fixed, right? And so uh, getting these business rules, understanding the valid value, some of it could just be you know do I understand the difference between a postal code and a I mean a a postal address and a physical address, right? Do I have a PO box or is it a physical address? Do I have the valid values right? So that that's kind of your data architecture that might be in a data model, but also your holistic enterprise architecture. I may have I had one client that I worked with and they had one of the industry really leading M master data management tools that was integrated very well with one of their systems, but wasn't integrated at all with about eighty percent of their other systems. So the perfect example of their, you know, their silo data architecture worked really well, um, but they were still having all of the classic problems of customers not having the right mailings and products not arriving at people's houses because they didn't look at that holistic architecture. They did the micro data architecture, which, again, wasn't wrong um, for them, um, but it was wrong for the organization because it wasn't tied into the larger data architecture and the larger data governance framework to get the right people at the table. Again, very few times in my career have I ever met someone who's maliciously saying, I want to you know, make my data quality bad, and if you do, that's an entirely different issue. Mostly, people just need to get their job done, and they don't see the downstream effect. Um, you know, if you're if you walked in a city and some of the uh, the, the, the covers to a to a you know a, a water drain might say you know this water flows into the Chesapeake Bay or something like that because you might not think when you dump your cigarette butts or your you know oil from your car into this you're just dumping it into this thing you don't realize that's going to be your drinking water down the <laughs> down the road right so I think often just education of where that data is going to go um, can be a, a big improvement. Um, in fact, I think I've told this story in the webinars before, but I need to tell it again. One of these, it was a retail company, and they were having the classic problem with their email addresses not being updated, not being correct. And some of their high-profile you know, loyalty customers were getting, didn't have their emails right. So we did a, you know, your classic data flow diagram and system architecture and showed it to the chief marketing officer. And not someone that would normally you know, be thinking of data, but we clearly showed what happened when we changed the email and it didn't flow. And she was very bubbly, as you can imagine, a market, and she said, oh, my gosh, I never thought in my life I would say the word data flow diagram, but I love it. That exactly explains why we have the problem. And, and so for those data architects on the call, you often can get a seat at the table up at 
you know, very high-level decisions if you explain kind of these impacts. And that's why I love data architecture, because you can really see how these small changes can affect something downstream. So then once you found these small things that affect something downstream, um, you build that business case, because there's a lot of things we could fix. What is the impact that this change is going to have? To keep going with that analogy, um, with that marketing company, what we did um, is basically a, a very targeted micro enterprise architecture, if that makes sense. We said there's a lot of issues. We know email is an issue. If we can just fix email address, that's going to fix 90% of our, our marketing mailings. It's going to help our loyalty program. It's going to help shipment because we sent shipment notices to our people. If we could just fix literally just email address, and we did the we did a cost benefit benefit. We had we had um, the marketing team sign up. We had supply chain sign up. Everyone just and of course we fixed some other problems along the way by understanding that flow of data. But we had a very targeted use case. We got people bought into governance, and we were able to solve things. So I think that's important to remember because it can be overwhelming, and there are a lot of things you could fix. But what's going to be the highest value? And then when you do have this high value, what do you do about it? And Nigel will talk more about this later. Uh, do you have a data improvement plan? You, know, you can't improve what you can't measure. So yes, we can all you know, tell the funny stories about uh, data quality, and we can complain about we found it wrong, but what, what tactical thing are we going to do, and what ROI is going to show from that? Um, and then you show the benefit from that, and that, that kind of closes that loop of the data, data governance framework. We can report on it. Everyone knows the value of it, and it's a repeatable process, which ties into our favorite topic, which is data governance. And it truly is a framework, down from, as we've both talked about, what are your business goals, why are we doing this, to why can't we do it with the data Ill, it, you know, issues and challenges. And keep it simple. Um, and Nigel and I, you know, Nigel mentioned it. I'm a fan as well. The more complex it gets, um, keep it simple. You know, anyone who's done anything, you know, think of pilots on the airplane. They have very simple checklists. I'm going to fly a massive plane with complex things. Did I turn the switch? Did I do X, Y, Z? And anyone you ever worked in emergency, um, you know, services or anything with complexity, they always go right down to basics. So especially if you're a technical person on the call and you're speaking to the business, just keep it very simple. We need to fix email address because it's affecting your marketing campaigns and we're losing 90,000 know, U.S. dollars in potential revenue as a result. Everyone can get their brain around that and then go fix it. So be very clear on what you're going to solve and how, and then get that right organization and people. And I'll just, I'll just use this analogy to death on the email because I think it's just so easy to understand, right? So that email address, who cares about getting the email address? I mentioned it before, sales cared, the loyalty program cared, you know, marketing cared, um, the supply chain cared. Get the right people involved and the right people to make the decision because so often you think you're being helpful. I don't want to bother people. I'll just fix this email. Um, and you, you realize that you're using it in a different way. For example, we actually went into the stores of this retail organization and looked, talked to the salespeople, and they said, oh, yeah, we never get email because we want to close the sale. Um, so we don't even ask. We just put in, you know, me at me.com and, and move on. And then we looked and we profiled data, and it was, you know, 20,000 me at me.com. And, and as soon as we explained what that email was used for, they changed it. But, again, had we not gone, literally gone into the sales floor and asked sales, we might not have seen that. We might have just that was a data quality issue. So think outside the box. Think of everyone that could affect and put a process in place, uh, which ties into the process and workflows. Do we have a process for data remediation? Do we have a process to escalate issues? Often the people that find the issues aren't the ones on your data governance steering committee. They're the ones in the field being affected by it. So how can they escalate that? How do you manage? How do I know what good looks like? How do I show ROI on that? Nigel will talk more about that. And culture and communication is, uh, we could do a whole, actually we have, we, a whole presentation just on that. And that's really what makes it sing. That's what solves the, you're going to fix data quality for me, right? No. Everyone realizes that, yes, data is everybody's res, you know, responsibility, and this particular piece of data is my accountability. And I will, I will you know, take charge of this, and I'll make sure it's right. And then, of course, the tools and technology, um, but that is really the icing on the cake. If you don't get the top of that house uh, right, then... You know, having the foundation doesn't help. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to Nigel, who's going to talk a little bit more about kind of um, how some of these trends have changed and how that will apply directly to data yeah. governance. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Donna. Um, yeah, I mean the good news is that that you know data, the data world has changed enormously since the sort of discipline of data quality really took off. I'd say around the 1990s, and in my experience, this is really how the focus has shifted. Um, when I started, pretty much data quality really only focused on batch because batch was the predominant mode in those days. So things like data warehouses and, um, uh, and, and, such, and such things were really the main focus. Today, there's a lot more focus on getting data right, as I mentioned, real-time online. 
And that suggests a whole new different approach to data quality because in batch, it's the, the implication is you can be reactive. You wait until the problems occur and then you fix them. Today, you can't afford to do that because in, in the digital world, you can't wait until things fail. You've got to get it right first time and prevent the problems from happening in the first place. I mentioned before, a lot of data quality was driven by the IT department. Today, through governance and other things and the rise of the digital company, it's now becoming much more business driven. So your approaches need to reflect all these things. Um, you know, it was very platform specific. So, you know, your CRM system had data quality problems. So let's try and fix those problems reactively um, in your CRM system. As Donna said today, it's much more about identifying the horizontal flow uh, inside and also outside your organization and how those flows are impacted by bad data as it passes through. Um, so enterprise-wide approaches are now necessary in order to get a good handle on this. Um, again, original emphasis on data cleanse. Um, you know, wait for the problem to occur, then do a cleanup, get the scrubbing brush out and scrub the data a bit. And the trouble was with that approach, of course, is that you never finish doing that because as soon as you cleaned it up, for, because the world changes so quickly, you're cleaning it again and again and again, which itself is a cost of failure. So there's a lot more discussion these days about the sort of data re-engineering approach. And I had this philosophy when I did this at a telco, which is that you don't fix data unless you fix a, a method for how to keep it fixed, because otherwise you constantly keep cleaning it all the time. A lot more focus on that the tool sets, as Don will touch on in a minute, have improved significantly. And today, I mean, a lot of the focus around better data quality is not on operational processes, tends to be more and more focused on, on reporting and analytics as big data and analytics becomes a lot more prevalent and important in organizations. Then so the importance of data quality and getting data quality right to support that BI analytics focus is becoming very important as well. And instead of putting data quality tools in platforms like data warehouses, today data quality tools are much more offered as service across the organization so that you have a set of common rules, as Donna mentioned earlier somewhere, and apply those rules to whatever system, whatever platform is using that common data. And so that means you can't be siloed anymore. You have to be part of a broader holistic data management change program, which was also touched on earlier in the conversation. But that's not to say the traditional approaches uh, to these problems are, don't still have a relevance because one of the things that we do find is you know when I started a long time ago in this field, you know people were really focused on some of the key systems like CRM systems, ERP, data warehouses, operational data stores, etc. And so the approaches that were originally developed then are still very relevant today when you're looking at some of the data issues in those areas. And I'm sure you're familiar with many of these things. You start basically by profiling the data, actually looking at the real data contained in those platforms. Um, looking at gaps, looking at uh, inconsistencies, looking at obvious errors, and sort of quantifying the baseline of that data, then developing some data standards and definitions, building the business rules on the basis of those, automating the cleanse and enhancement wherever you could, embedding those standards and rules then into batch and sometimes real-time environments, producing the, the KPIs to make sure that you, this isn't a, a project that goes away, it becomes a continuous process. So data quality improvement becomes not a one-off project, but it actually becomes a continuous business as usual process. But I think you know the way that things have changed, and there's a sort of what I call the new age of data quality now, you know, for digital organizations in particular, those approaches in themselves, although they have value, aren't enough. And there's, I think, an increasing need as well for some of the approaches that you see here. And I'm not going to go through all these for, in terms of time, but you know, an increased focus these days on validation rather than cleanse and, and, and enhancement at the back end. It's got to be done at the front end. And I think you know, the, the concept of intelligence at the edge is now being accompanied by something what I call data quality at the edge. So if, for example, you have a smart meter or you have an Internet of Things device, then building some data, basic data quality checking into those devices is a good idea so that you're pretty confident the data will be correct by the time it hits the systems rather than waiting till it hits the systems and then trying to sort the problems out there. Golden rule, I think, of, of IT that we're all familiar with. If you prevent a problem, you fix it a lot more easily than if you wait for the problem to occur. 
So some of those things, I think, uh, are, are, are going to be increasingly important. And I think as well, things like artificial intelligence, for example, um, looking at methods. Certainly, I work part time in Cardiff University, my home city. Uh, they're looking at things like self-checking data quality tools and algorithms in AI so that if the data sort of feels wrong, the system itself learns that the data is wrong and starts to flag up some of the issues and some of the uh, some of the errors with it. As Donna mentioned as well, I mean, the days of IT control of all this have gone and that the, the tool sets and the approaches these days need to give the business users a lot more control in terms of uh, you know, dynamically preparing business rules. So as mentioned, fit for purpose becomes more complicated because what's fit for one uh, one uh, business intelligence consumer will be different for another, but that's fine. That's how dynamic and flexible these the, these approaches and tools need to be. Um, and you know, because of end user self service data quality, so a lot of those users themselves eventually, and I don't think we're there yet, are going to need some of these capabilities themselves, rather than passing the buck to IT and saying, "Excuse me, can you do some data preparation for me?" And clearly, these end users need to do that themselves. There simply isn't time. IT would become a bottleneck. And so if you do so have tool sets, and Donna will touch on those in a minute, to support um, improving data quality, they must be able to operate in a much wider variety of platforms than previously. So, you know, where they can operate in a Hadoop big data warehouse as long as in a traditional relational data warehouse, for example, both in real time and batch, and also increasingly operate in sort of semi-structured and more unstructured data types. So that you can do some data profiling, for example, of key data within unstructured data. Uh, a lot of that is beginning to take shape. And I think over the next few years, we'll see more and more commercial tools come out that actually will make that a, a reality for much many more organizations and at the current time. So those are some of the things, the new ways. And uh, But it's finding the right balance is important. So I'll hand back to Donna as well to talk about that a bit more. Donna. So, sure. So as we sort of mentioned, you know, we have to be realistic and, and proactive uh, about this, but there's also the realities of, of, of life, right? So I think the right, the proper mix will always be a mix of both human and automated because data quality is fit for purpose for human beings, so we can automate a lot of that. So what is that right balance between what can we automate, what can we fix after the fact, what do we do up front? And it, obviously it's a continuum, but if we think of kind of maybe we start with the right with this, if, if sort of we're resolving it after the fact, that kind of post-process. So that's, you know, resolving at the source or versus post-processing what's automated and what needs to be have sort of human intervention. Well, if you think of sort of if, so if you're high human intervention and, and sort of high post, you know, doing it after the fact, you know, often when Nigel and I build sort of data governance frameworks, one of the first things to do, and it's still, I, we still say it's a good idea, but it is very reactive of what are some of these, uh, these uh, issues, let's do a data quality working group, fix them quickly and move on. So it makes governance popular um, and you can do some of that reactive to existing problems. Um, but wouldn't it be better to do that more proactively? Um, so how do you do that? Things like business process change. Can we think when we're designing a new process, how to add the data flow to it? So I'm a big fan of process models. Um, and whenever we look at uh, the data issues, we, what, what's wrong with it? What, what's the issue with the process? Can, can we design those processes up front? Do we have the right policies and procedures? Do we understand that the governance steering committee should have this not happen? Can we train people? Um, some of my customers are actually um, – they're on industry advice. You know, sometimes it's a data exchange, or you know, we can't be the first people on the planet who have, have you know managed addresses, <laughs> um, or we're in retail and then retail product codes. Um, and so to, to help that, a lot of my customers are actually on some of these industry advisory councils to get you know cross data quality correct. Um, definitions and glossaries. I could do my whole metadata rant here, but I won't. Of just often knowing how that data is used can go a long way. You know, people are trying to put in the best answer. Um, for example, one of my clients is a nonprofit, and they have children and parents, and it asked education level. And the data quality was terrible because people really didn't know. Do you mean the education level of the parent, um, college educated versus high school, or of the child who's you know in kindergarten? And there was an, uh, and, and the data drop downs didn't help. There was a free text, so of course <laughs> that's wrong. Teach people what the, what you mean by education level. That would have been an easy fix, and we actually did fix that. Um, kind of the in-between at the human level of proactive, of planning ahead, and reactive to this idea of state of stewardship. Those are the people that, yes, can be fixing things as they go, but also looking ahead and, and proactively understanding. And then this might seem strange, but conscious disregard. <laughs> Sometimes we know there's issues, but we can't fix everything. Um, and so I think that's almost the most valuable, to pick the right things. You know, So someone, we filled out a survey 
and we asked for their favorite hobby, and everyone put in a sarcastic answer. Does that really matter? No, but it matters that they put in the wrong email, right? So just, just pick, pick your right battles. So when we think of on the tech side, similar thing. You can we talked about this already. You can after the fact clean up the data. That's only going to be a one-time fix. You'll keep cleaning it and keep cleaning it and keep cleaning it. Similar with ETL, um, you can fix it in the warehouse, but that might even be more confusing because people see it wrong in the source. So ideally, you do want to fix it in the source. Um, so this application data entry and workflow, that example I had with the parents and children, if the drop-downs were kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, it would have been pretty obvious. Uh, you wouldn't need a, a data dictionary because it would have been obvious what you need to fill in versus college, you know, PhD, et cetera. Um, application level validation, similarly, can you have a drop-down if you want M and F versus male and female, put the right to validation and only give them two options, or the valid state codes in the U.S., et cetera. And a lot of that can be driven by your data models. And as Nigel mentioned, a lot of these data quality tools can validate the source. They can go look at, you know, valid addresses and against um, a database and say, yes, that's that back to those dimensions of data quality. It's a correct email, but it doesn't exist. I mean, address, but it doesn't exist anywhere. You can't mail to that and kind of do automated data quality checks. And again, kind of in the middle of this idea of audit and dashboards, we're always, you know, if you can't manage what you can't measure, so do you have an, a, a dashboard that's proactively always auditing? Uh, we are recommending often in at these steering committees, if, if email and address and gender codes and age are important for your demographics, look at them every data uh, quality steering committee meeting or data governance meeting or whatever you're calling them and make sure you're getting better. Um, and sometimes, again, it kind of ties with this validation. You can use external data sources to kind of validate that. So anyway, lots of tools of the trade, which leads me to tools. Uh, there, we often ask, what's the right tool for the job? There is no one tool. <laughs> um, and and some of the tools have gotten better. There's is overlap. A lot of the MDM tools have data profiling. A lot of the data pro, you know, modeling tools have metadata. Um, a lot of the pure play data quality tools do a lot of these things from analysis to augmentation, et cetera. So the key thing is that you want to have business rules that can be used across systems that can be repeatable and used across all test tool sets so that the, the, uh, the business rule you create in one can be cascaded across. So really when you get these right, we've talked a lot about each, this idea of data governance, data architecture, and data quality, it really is this sort of virtuous cycle, right? So data governance provides the people and the policy and the, and the prioritization that helps drive the architecture that provides the model and the integration and the prioritization. And then quality actually can, you know, is, is the culmination of that, of can I track the metrics and the um, business quality rules that then tie into governance to fix them. And you really need all of those in equal measure in place. Um, to really get this right. None of them lives in a vacuum. So the other piece we mentioned as a result of these is, you know, identifying it, find the business value of it, um, prioritize it, and then fix it, and, and make sure you're fixing it in a holistic and documented way, which is what Nigel is going to talk about in this idea of data improvement plans. Yeah, thanks, Donna. Um, this, this, this is something that I really encourage um, if you're embarking on any data quality improvement work, whether it's at a, an organizational level, a departmental level, or maybe within a single, a single platform or a single system. But having a plan, I think, is really important. I don't know who said it, it's a cliche, I know, but if you fail to plan, then basically you're planning to fail. And in my experience, unless you have some really hard targets and you treat this like and you would treat any good solid project plan, um, then you're never going to succeed. And you, you see there that's just the heading um, from a sort of a typical data improvement plan that we've been involved in helping companies with. You know, you need to look at the data area and the elements involved. So what's the scope, as Donna said earlier, of the data that you should focus on? Then what are the key issues and problems with that data? And those problems have to be defined, not in terms that 32% of the times this particular field is missing. It's got to be in terms of we can't email all our, all our customers on our marketing list because 32% of our email addresses are missing. So it's got to be related back to the business somewhere. And basically, I mean, lots of benefits of having this approach. How do you create one? Um, I could talk for a whole presentation about this, so I tried to summarize it in one slide. And um, How do you go about creating an, an improvement plan for data? One of the things I should stress, by the way, is that it doesn't imply that you, know, you would have a customer data improvement plan or a product data improvement plan. They would be valid areas, but sometimes your data quality issue could be focused around the business process. So it could, for example, be something like a, um, a customer fulfillment data quality plan because the process is beset at the moment 
with a, with a whole series of data quality issues as the data flows across that process. So you can apply these at all sorts of levels to all sorts of things. But basically, your approach would be the same. You investigate the data, you baseline it, identify some of the key problems, you get organized to look at fixing it. Um, you then prioritize which of the problems that you come across you need to address first. And that is normally purely on the basis of value to the business and which things will create the biggest buck, if you like, for your bank. Um, your biggest bang for your buck, I should say, in the initial phase, and then and then the improvement phase after that, and then very often these data improvement plans not don't look, become a single project with a beginning and end date, but they become almost a continuous process. So, for example, you might start with a with a customer fulfilment data quality working group, but that could very well turn into a stewardship group, which sits on a continuous basis to continue to improve the data as the needs of that data changes. So I'm a great advocate for having those. And I mentioned as well, one of the things I firmly believe in is never do any data quality improvement work unless you first of all have a business case for action. And this is a very simple example from a real client actually, um, that I, that an organization I was with, worked with a few years ago, uh, who basically were doing online gaming, not everyone's favorite type of uh, or company, but they were a customer. And they had issues with customer data and also with their sales data. And you can see there that we spent some time with them actually figuring out how much these things were costing their bottom line and how much the improved revenue was going to be or cost reduction would be from improving the data to a certain threshold. And there were some pretty big numbers there. So you can see that that gives you the justification for what you do. And if you want, um, I spent 10 years of my life working in, um, in BT. And um, if you think these, these, uh, if you want any evidence, if you like, that some of the approaches that Donna and I have talked about work, this is probably as good a case study as any, although it's quite an old one now, but I still have people who, who still refer back to it. And uh, BT, through approaches that we've just described, aggregated more than $800 million in benefits as a result of a whole series of data improvement projects that it ran within a, an overall data improvement program. And BT saved lots and lots of money through those three things. And if you want to validate that, rep independent reports on that program were conducted both by Gartner and by Forrester. And I think if you hunt the internet, they're still available somewhere. If you can't find them, let me know. I've got copies of them. So these approaches really do work. So uh, just back to you to sum up and finish, Donna. Sure. So yeah, as we mentioned, this is a holistic approach, which kind of you know identifies a lot of the you know organization and technological issues. And I know Shannon's probably wanting to open it up for questions, so I'll, I'll let, pass it to you, Shannon. Donna, thank you so much. And Nigel, thank you so much for joining us for this great topic and conversation. Just uh, to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and the recording. And if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A section. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation going on. But no direct questions coming in yet. <laughs> All right, then I will. Hurry up! One. Let's go. To, uh, is, uh, uh, <laughs> everyone's like, yes, we disagree. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we only had a couple minutes to share anyway, but we have been kind of following some of the great dis dis discussion as we went. So yeah, join us next uh, next month for BI and analytics uh, for self service, and um, this will all be recorded if you want to pass it along to your friends. Yeah, and uh, Nigel, there's a, there are a couple of requests for the case study. If you have a link to it, if you send that to me, I'll get it out in the follow-up as well. Yeah, and actually at the bottom, uh, you'll notice that if you're a Gartner client, that is the number of the publication from Gartner. Um, oh, there you go. All right. Well, thank you again, Nigel. Thank you so much for joining us in the late evening for you. I really appreciate it. And Donna, thanks as always. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything. I love the conversation going on throughout. And um, again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday. Thank thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hey.